Okay, so my name is Jason Rio. Thanks everyone for coming. This has been a great morning and uh, early afternoon sessions so far. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my work using uh, zebrafish to study sleep. And in particular, I'm going to tell you uh, about one set of projects we've been doing to map autism genes onto sleep phenotypes uh, in the fish. So the outline of my very quick talk, not as many points as Vlad was able to get through, but uh, I will uh, first talk about why we think that uh, autism spectrum disorder is uh, an interesting uh, 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 disorder in respect to sleep. And then I'm going to give you the kind of whiz-bang, why fish are great to study uh, sleep as a neuroscience model. Uh, and that will also serve as an introduction for the talk right after mine by uh, Sabine Reichert. And then uh, I will talk a little bit about how we've been sleep phenotyping uh, zebrafish autism mutants. Okay, so autism spectrum disorder is a set of heterogeneous uh, neurodevelopmental conditions that have basically two core phenotypes. The first is uh, patients have persistent deficits in social communication, and that can be across both verbal and nonverbal kinds of communication. And they often show restricted and repetitive behaviors. I mean, the, both of those things are core symptoms uh, that, uh, that autistic patients have. And the prevalence for autism is pretty high. It's about 1% of the population. Now, despite these kind of core symptoms that define autism, autism is actually quite a complex phenotype, and patients present with a variety of comorbidities, uh, including anxiety, ADHD, uh, uh, they often have seizures in some, in some proportion of uh, autistic patients. And one of the ones that caught our attention in particular was uh, sleep disruption. So uh, about 50 to 80 percent of autistic individuals suffer from sleep disorders. And there's evidence that suggests that this disruption in sleep actually impacts uh, their, uh, their ability to uh, interact, and it basically increases the severity of the core symptoms. So, for example, if you treat uh, sleep, you can improve um, behavioral outcomes. And sleep, therefore, is potentially a therapeutically tractable aspect of autism that is uh, accessible for uh, patients. And so that might be an interesting avenue for um, treatment. Uh, on top, layered on top of this complex phenotype is the rather complex genetics that underlie autism. This is probably why autism is uh, presented with such a variety of phenotypes. Uh, this I took from the Simons Research uh, Foundation uh, website. They have uh, great resources, actually outdated. This is a map of all the autism risk genes that have been uh, identified, uh, many of them have good to strong evidence now. So we're, we're talking about at least 50 genes that have a strong association with causing autism. And one of the challenges in the autism field is to now map those genetic, that genetic complexity onto uh, the underlying mechanism. So the circuits that are altered in order to drive the, uh, the, the changes in behavior at the end. And you know what you know, can we can we actually map that diversity onto the diverse behavioral outcomes? So enter the fish. This is uh, the model that we work on, but we don't actually work on uh, the adult fish. This is uh, this is uh, at an adult, of course. We we work on the larvae, and the larvae offer certain advantages uh, that we are trying to take advantage of, both for sleep and for autism, and broadly for neuroscience generally. The first is that they start out as a single cell that sits on top of this huge yolk, and this yolk fuels really rapid development such that by 24 hours you already have a patterned fish. You, already ha you can already see the brain is formed, you can already see its eye is starting to develop, and these fish will already respond to simple stimuli like touch. And then just a few days after that, five days, the fish uh, can swim around and do things like sleep. Uh, they can actually do quite complex things by five days of age. They can do hunting behavior, for example. This fish was a single cell just a few days ago, and now it's able to track in a complex way paramecia and basically eat them. 
The other thing that's great about the fish at this age is that they're optically transparent. If you watched closely, you might have been able to see the paramecium go down all the way into its gullet. But that allows us to be able to actually dive down into their brain. In, this is a live fish, and we've labeled the cells with, in this case, a genetic encoded calcium indicator, and we're using a two-photon microscope just to dive down into the brain. We're taking a stack from the top down into the bottom, and then we're driving back up. And we get cellular resolution here. You can see the nuclei are in black, and the cells are in, uh, if we zoom here, in like the optic tectum. And what that allows us to do is to image in vivo uh, the neural behavior of single neurons in a whole brain, or in, this is zoomed in on one part of the brain in particular, as the fish is responding to stimuli. So in this case, the fish is uh, in a virtual reality environment, if you will. It's uh, essentially paralyzed, but it's freely able to respond to the environment. And we can tell what the fish wanted to do by recording from the, from the motor nerve. And in this case, we're presenting uh, moving stripes to the fish, which they find incredibly uh, exciting, I guess, or salient. And they'll respond to these moving stripes forever. And we're able to record neural activity as we change the stimulus. And just to highlight how powerful that is, we can create whole brain maps of neurons that, for example, are associated with forward moving swims or stimuli that respond to uh, left or right turns. And that, in turn, allows us to make quantitative circuit models in which we can follow the flow of information, essentially, through the circuit from, uh, to drive uh, the sensory motor transformation to, uh, from the eye to behavior. The other great thing about the fish being transparent is that we can label synapses in vivo. Uh, this is um, just an example using these uh, intrabodies. These are essentially genetically encoded uh, uh, molecules that will bind in vivo to synapses that they don't really affect the function of the synapse, but they label them. In this case, they're labeling uh, the PSD95 molecules, but we can also label inhibitory synapses in vivo. And I'm just showing over here a reconstruction of a single synapse. This is an alive fish, and because it's an alive fish, that means that we can image it repeatedly from one day to the next. So for example, we can image synapses in the same cell, in the same fish, and we can look at how synapses are added or subtracted uh, through uh, behavioral parameters. We can also do behavioral phenotyping over long, uh, long time scales, and so this is what this looks like. Essentially, we have a 96-well plate, and we watch with the video camera, and we quantify their behavior in an automated fashion. We can do that for uh, hundreds of fish. This is just showing the different kinds of behavioral modules as they vary from, I think you can appreciate that they have different behavioral modules in, say, the day and the night, and they repeat. And this is, each row is a different fish. So we can track hundreds of fish at a time. Now, if we zoom in on their behavior, what you can see on a single larvae is that they're diurnal. So they're active during the day, and they're less active at night. Uh, so uh, they have this circadian rhythm that's uh, light-driven. Uh, but if we zoom in now here on this gray, you can see that there's actually a lot of behavioral dynamics that go on. Uh, when the lights go out, they have a sleep latency where they are active for a while, and then they enter these long runs of being inactive where they stop moving for minutes at a time, tens of minutes at a time in some cases, and then they have little wake bouts, and then they intersperse that with more uh, rest bouts throughout the night. And uh, I don't have time to show this, but... Uh, using uh, changes in arousal threshold and the uh, homeostatic and circadian uh, responses of these inactive bouts, we know that these uh, bouts are sleep states or at least associated with sleep uh, uh, properties that we see in other animals. And we can take this behavioral dynamics and we can create what we call a behavioral fingerprint. Essentially, this is a vector that quantifies how often they enter and exit sleep states during the day and during the night. And uh, that allows us to say, for example, now, um, if we add a drug, ask how do the different behavioral parameters change across the day and the night. And what this kind of throughput allows us to do is screens. Uh, 
So one of the things we've done in the past, this was uh, done uh, when I was in Alex Shear's lab uh, many years ago now, we did a drug screen in which we just added different kinds of drugs, 6,000 drugs almost, uh, and then just asked how that affected their behavior. And that allowed us to identify hundreds of drugs that uh, modify their behavior in different ways. Uh, there's the alpha-2 adrenergic cluster down here somewhere. Like we found dozens of those that give a similar behavioral phenotype. Uh, but also we found all kinds of different uh, sedatives and, um, and stimulants throughout this kind, of, uh, this kind of series. And this will be relevant to uh, how we map uh, some drugs that affect autism genes in a moment. And one of the things that we can do is because the drugs that give the same phenotype very often hit the same target, like for example the alpha adrenergic cluster that I mentioned, we're able to use this kind of uh, guilt by association. Basically, if we have a molecule that looks like another molecule's behavior, we can predict that that might be because it has the same target. And in fact, we were able to show for a monoamine oxidase inhibitor cl cluster that gives this kind of behavioral fingerprint that uh, a drug that was not known to be a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, in fact, is, as shown uh, by an in vitro binding assay. Okay, so great, the fish are good for doing kind of neuroscience. So now what about sleeping uh, autism mutants? I'm going to show you uh, uh, one autism mutant in particular. This is called catnap. And we modified this. this is, we actually modified it a long time ago before you, uh, people use CRISPRs nowadays. We use CRISPRs routinely in the lab to make mutations in dozens of genes simultaneously. But these was actually made using zinc finger nucleases. Those old methods work too to modify genes. And uh, in the fish, there are two catnaps uh, expressed widely in the brain, and we mutated both of them simultaneously, and this is just a Western blot showing that these mutants, double mutants, make essentially no protein for the catnap. And catnap, I should say, is one of the very strongly associated autism risk genes, because if you get a homozygous truncation in catnap, as some consanguineous uh, families' um, children uh, do, uh, they have severe autism. And these fish are uh, viable and fertile, and they look okay. But if we now monitor their um, sleep-wake assay uh, in this kind of long-term tracking, what we see, in fact, is that they have a very selective phenotype. They have behavioral hyperactivity, but only at night. And I, they have a little bit less activity in the very early morning. And what I like about this is that it suggests that there's a lot of complexity to how um, behavior is being modulated. It's not just uh, you're just constantly hyper-aroused all the time. You can have very day-time-specific phenotypes. And this is just zoomed in here, showing you that they're actually quite more active uh, specifically at night. And so one of the tricks that we did um, was use what we, what we called, we called this different things. We called this directed drug screening. We, we called it predictive pharmacology, and we also called it go fish after the card game in which you're trying to match cards uh, with different, you know, with the same, you know, the same card, basically. And in this case, what you're trying to do is match now that autism behavioral output to the drug landscape that I mentioned uh, a few slides ago. And when you do that, you now cluster the catnap fish into that uh, drug data landscape, and you now ask what kind of drugs land uh, near catnap. And in fact, those drugs are uh, NMDA antagonists, turns out. Uh, and now that's predictive for how the fish will respond to drugs. So for example, if I now give NMDA antagonists to the catnap uh, fish, they become, they're, it synergizes. They're extremely hyperactive in response, even at doses where there's almost no effect in the wild type. But more uh, excitingly, from a kind of therapeutic prediction kind of point of view, uh, we're able to actually predict the opposite. We're able to predict drugs that, uh, that anti-correlate. Basically, these are drugs that give kind of the opposite phenotype uh, in wild-type fish, and now we could predict that maybe these kinds of drugs um, would rescue the behavioral hyperactivity. And in fact, that was enriched for a very specific class of drugs. It was enriched for estrogens. And when we tested one of these estrogens, 
Um, in particular, this is a phytoestrogen. Uh, it can be found in soybeans, I guess. It's called uh, biochannin A. We find that, for example, here's the hyperactivity of the catnap uh, compared to wild type in the black here. But when we add the drug, we can rescue catnap to wild type levels. This is not significantly different from uh, the wild type. And in fact, this is at doses that have no effect on the wild type. And I also want to highlight that this is not a sedation. We're not just hitting them with a sledgehammer of uh, a sedative because their daytime activity is unaffected. And so what that suggests is that we're actually tickling a specific part of the brain uh, that's estrogen sensitive that is disrupted in these mutants. And now we're trying to map that, uh, that in the brain using our whole brain uh, imaging techniques and using some methods that Sabine will mention in the next talk. Okay, now just to finish up, uh, what we're trying to do now is basically expand this, uh, uh, our roster to additional genes and ask how do additional drugs, if we now, or additional uh, autism mutants map onto this uh, behavioral spectrum. And just to give you one example, if we now look at a different autism mutant in our sleep-wake trace, we actually found this uh, mutant, this is a CHD8. These kids have really severe sleep disruption. Uh, they can have a severe insomnia. But in the fish, we see no defect uh, kind of in their normal activity uh, levels in a light-dark cycle. But in fact, they actually um, have a problem in sleep consolidation. So they're not able to uh, maintain these long bouts of inactivity. So this curve, for example, the red curve, the mutant curve is shifted to the left. And we can use a measure of sleep consolidation. You can see that it's um, much... Uh, much poorer in the, in the mutant fish. And so just to conclude, what we, what we think we're beginning to do now is take autism risk genes, mapping those onto behavior, and we're trying to figure out what the circuits are in the middle. And uh, it's unclear still from our, uh, from our first examples that um, you know, whether or not we're going to find, you know, what's going to be the phenotypic overlap? Like how, if we do this now for 50 genes, will they mo look more like the catnap or will they look more like the CHD8 type? Uh, that remains to be seen. But I think it's actually really exciting that, you know, the first two that we've tested have um, very selective kinds of sleep phenotypes that we haven't seen in either drug or other kinds of uh, sleep mutants that we've tested in the lab so far. Okay, and with that, I need to conclude and thank people in the lab. Uh, this is my lab. And in particular, I should mention that this work was done in collaboration with a group at Yale, in particular, Ellen Hoffman, uh, when she was in uh, Antonio Herodes' lab, and now she has her own lab. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jason. We have uh, just a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, then uh, I can ask a question in the meantime. Uh, so uh, when you record uh, calcium signals during, uh, can you record calcium signals during sleep? And if, do you see anything interesting happening uh, in fish when it sleeps? So, so we can do that. Um, we haven't done that systematically yet. Uh, it takes a bit of tricks to get them to sleep properly when they're under the microscope. Uh, so that's been one of the biggest challenges. And then, of course, once they're under there, how do we know that they're asleep, for example? And so uh, I think uh, one of the things that we're hoping to do, uh, Sabine's talk next, will show how we can really drive strong uh, rebound sleep. Uh, and in that case, we really drive sleep pressure very strongly. And so we're hoping to couple that assay with um, those kinds of measurements where we can just really push the system. Uh, there is one last question on the back, please. It's hard to see out there. <laughs> Sorry, one quick question. Sure. So in uh, rodents, so mouse and rats that have catnap 2 mutations, they have very poor phenotypic screening for sleep-wake disorders that are seen in humans. Whereas from your data, it suggests that the zebrafish are much more better at recapitulating what you see in patients. So do you think that we need to move away 
from certain rodent models more to fish, or do you think there's something specific about the fish themselves that make them better models for autism spectrum disorders? So I would be a little cautious in, in how I respond to that. One thing I would say is uh, the Casper mutant, the catnap mice, do, show, do recapitulate some aspects of the human disorder, and the fish does as well. So, for example, I didn't show this, but we lose a lot of, uh, the fish loses, and so does the mouse lose uh, GABAergic interneurons um, uh, and have a migration of GABAergic interneurons uh, that's defective. So I'm not sure it's really fair to say that the fish is exactly better than the mouse. The mice also have some behavioral hyperactivity that hasn't been really well documented or reported. Um, and then the other thing I would just add is that, you know, the fish are diurnal, and I think a lot of things that, a lot of times in the rodent, the valence of response in, when you make different kinds of genetic mutations, for, at least for sleep disruption, for example, uh, can, can affect, you know, how the, how the mouse brain is interpreting different kinds of signals is, is flipped, often relative to what uh, humans do. And so that may underlie some of the reason we see some phenotypic difference. I think we should move on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jason.